Welcome students to Enfuego 2020. You know it's summertime now and that's why we uh, picked this theme Enfuego because it's going to be hot. It's, we got a lot of great uh, worship for you in store. We got Snipes coming at you with a message tonight. Really excited about you being here. So without further ado, we're going to jump right in and thanks for being here tonight. Nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living home. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen. The sweetest of loves When my heart becomes free And my shame is undone Your presence, Lord Holy Spirit, you are welcome here Come first and fill the atmosphere Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for To be overcome by Your presence, Nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living home. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen. Flood 
embrace and fill the atmosphere Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for To be overcome by your presence, Lord Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling.
are here Moving in our midst I worship you I worship you You are here Working in this place I worship you I worship you You are here Moving in our midst I worship you I worship you You are here Working in this place I worship you I worship you Cause you are Waymaker, miracle worker Promise keeper Light in the darkness My God That is who you are and You are Waymaker, miracle worker Promise keeper Light in the darkness My God That is who you are You are here Touching every heart, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, healing every heart, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, turning lives up.
promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. All right, welcome, First Baptist Poplarville. Uh, my name is Will Snipes. Hopefully I know a lot of you from summers at Carson Newman and trips to Poplarville, a really special place in my heart, full of awesome people that I love. Um, but I've been given the privilege for the next several nights to speak to you guys, obviously in a, in a virtual format, um, but to be with you as you have a time of camp, of renewal, of revival, of focus, uh, on your relationship with the Lord and your uh, youth group and what God's called you to do there in the place where you are. And I'm just lucky enough to get to be with you guys, I believe, for the next four nights as we build around this theme called En Fuego, On Fire. Uh, when Coach Ray, as you guys call him, when you first, uh, he first contacted me about this and told me this idea, I was excited. Uh, I don't want to feel like every night we need to keep talking about fire, um, but a lot we are. Uh, things... In scripture about fire its meaning its purpose uh, different stories where we see fire being significant in the story um, but ultimately we want to come back to kind of a theme verse which is Jeremiah chapter 20 verse 9 uh, where God's Word through his prophet Jeremiah talks about um, that, that his word God's Word Jeremiah says burns in my heart like a fire like a fire in my bones like God's Word is such a part of us and it is so continuous and consuming like fire in our bones. That's how much God's Word is a part of us. And you may be thinking right now, I'm not there. A lot of times when I read that verse, I think I'm, I'm nowhere near there. Um, but tonight, I want to teach you some things from God's Word. I want to teach you some, some things about the character of God and who He is. And I want those things to get in you and get in your bones and become a part of you. Uh, you know, when something's in your bones, it's, it's about as deep in you as it can, as it can get. Um, not to be negative here, but just to be honest with you guys, if you ever know someone who is, is dealing with cancer in different parts of their body, I've been told um, that once cancer is in the bones, it's really serious. A lot of times there may not be much that can be done because that cancer has gotten as deeply into that person as it really can. And uh, I don't want to talk about that, but I want to talk about the Word of God being like a fire in my bones. It's deep inside of me and it burns, right? There's a passion there. So we're going to be talking about fire. We're going to be talking about growing in our knowledge and understanding of the Lord and how awesome and great He is. Tonight, we're going to talk in a, in a place that seems like a great place to start, and that's the burning bush. Uh, found in Exodus chapter 3, why I've chosen for this talk to be outside. Uh, around the forest and in some thorns as we get into the story the burning bush was actually probably a thicket of, of brambles or thorns uh, I know you can't see but I'm pretty much standing in some thorns right now taking one for the team for Poplarville so we're gonna turn to Exodus chapter 3 we're gonna read verses 1 through 15 we're gonna see God reveal himself in a new incredible way to Moses we're going to see what God wants to tell us about his own character as we see Moses encounter God at the burning bush. Let me tell you this word. Uh, I know at least one of you will write it down. It's a theophany. Theo, T-H-E-O, meaning uh, God, like theology. And then the P-H-A-N-Y part, theophany, is an appearance. A theophany is an appearance of God in a form that is visible to man. So a lot of people believe, side note real quick, uh, in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when King Nebuchadnezzar sees a fourth being in there, that that was a theophany. It was an appearance of God that was visible to man. The burning bush is a theophany because it is an appearance of God in a form that man can see. Let's read Exodus 3, 1 through 15. One day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, 
the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses. Here I am, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey. The land where the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites now live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abuse them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people out of Egypt. But Moses protested to God, Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? God answered, I will be with you. And this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. But Moses protested, If I go to the people of Israel and tell them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me, What is his name? Then what should I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am, has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. Again, that's verses 1 through 15 from Exodus chapter 3. I want to point out some things, teach you some things uh, tonight as we start this week off. First of all, uh, please notice that God called Moses by name. He called him personally. I want you to know tonight that God knows your name. God knows your story. God knows your ups and your downs. Scripture tells us God knows the words before you speak them. I love this. God knows you better than you know yourself. And you think, mm, there's not anybody that knows Will Snipes like Will Snipes knows Will Snipes. God knows me and my heart and my intentions and my thoughts and my ups and my downs and my fears and my failings. He knows me better than I know myself and he knows me by name and he calls me by name. Names are important to me. I try to learn names at camp. Some of you, I would know your name. I would remember your name. I've, I've spent time with you. Many of you, I might know your face. Some of you, I probably haven't met before. I couldn't call all of you by name, and I definitely don't know all your stories, don't know all your lives, don't know the ins and outs, the emotions and the hurts and the, the desires. God knows you by name. And when he calls, he calls by name. He calls Moses by name. So why did God reveal himself out of a burning bush, you know? Pretty awesome that he's going to make himself known to Moses, who's going to be given this incredibly important task to lead the people out of Egypt. Why did God reveal himself out of a burning bush? Let me offer a few reasons. First of all, to show his holiness. This is the first time that the Bible uses the word holy. When God talks about being holy and holiness in this passage, when he's speaking to Moses from that burning bush, it's the first time in the Bible that we see the word holy. And I've learned something here, even as I was preparing for this. Holiness, if you're taking notes, write this down. Holiness involves separation. Okay? We think holiness just means like being perfect, being right, being good, doing the right things. Holiness involves separation. Let me explain that. 
God is set apart from everything that he has made. I love this. It's not just his righteousness. It's not that he's just always just and fair and right, but it's the fact that he has an otherness. There's something about him that is completely distinct and different. There is a distinction between the creator and the created. And listen to this, go in deep on the first night, but I love it. There is an infinite distance between God's deity, his godness, and our humanity. And I know you can't wrap your mind around infinite, something that's without an end. I can't do that either. But as much as we're capable of, think about there is an endless, infinite distance between how God-like God is, his otherness, his righteousness, his holiness, his godness. There, the creator, and us, me, here, the created. Struggling and weak and tempted and messed up and sinful and, and lazy and selfish. And then there's this infinite distance to the holiness of God. Here's a couple of scriptures to back that up. Scriptures I didn't know, write them down. Hosea, Old Testament prophet, Hosea 11, 9. I am God and not man, the Holy One among you. I am God, and I'm not trying to be mean about this, but I am not you, okay? I am God and not man, the Holy One among you. And then the people's response to that, friends, the people often in the Old Testament, they understood the holiness of God. Didn't mean they didn't struggle, but they understood the holiness of God. Their response, their call back to him from 1 Samuel 2, 2, there is no one holy like and when God reveals himself through that burning bush, when he speaks through that burning bush, it's him revealing his holiness to us. How about his glory? Not only does he reveal his holiness, but he reveals his glory, meaning this, just the sheer majesty of God, just how incredible, how incredible he is. I like this. That, that when he reveals himself in those flames, in that bush, it's a visible reminder in dark times. There are dark times coming for these people. You know the story, a lot of you do. Moses is gonna attempt to lead them. Pharaoh is gonna resist. We're gonna have the 10 plagues. Pharaoh's gonna keep saying, I'm gonna let you go. No, I'm not, I'm gonna let you go. No, I'm not. The people are enslaved, they're in bondage, they're building, they're making stuff. It's a terrible existence. It's dark times. And here is this visible image of light. God is gonna make this known, the word is manifest. He's gonna manifest that first to Moses in this bush. Here's a visible image in the midst of dark times and God's gonna to continue to do that. God's gonna soon be that visible image, remember in that pillar of fire. Remember that pillar of fire that the people, once they did escape from Egypt, they would follow that pillar of cloud in the daytime and that pillar of fire at night. And so God's glory is majesty visible to them. And finally, as we talk about why did God reveal himself out of a burning bush, God wanted to show his concern for his people in that very moment. This passage, friends, you're learning so much. This passage is the first time that God calls the nation of Israel, my people, his people. I've been thinking about my friend Alex Creel a lot. I hope you're listening, Alex. And I can just see Alex. I don't know if you, if you use these words, Alex. I do keep up with you a little bit, but I can hear Alex saying, these are my people, you know? My teammates, my friends, my boys, these are my people. And in this passage, it's the first time that God calls Israel my chosen nation, my chosen one, my people. He has such concern for them. He's heard their cries. That was in that passage that we read. He's heard their cries for deliverance. They are in bondage.
to slavery, physical slavery. And God says, I have concern for you. You are my people. I have heard your cries for freedom. And I love this, friends. The incredible thing about this bush, and I would set something on fire out here, but that's dangerous. The incredible thing about this bush and this fire was that it was not consumed or not destroyed. It just kept on burning. I mean, Moses is there. He's interacting with this thing. He's talking to this thing. And it is not consumed or destroyed. Like if I lit something on fire out here right now, it'd be gone. You guys have seen that. You've seen how fire consumes, but this one didn't. And God is saying, I will not consume or destroy my people. I hear their cries. I hear their, their pleas for deliverance and for freedom. And I will not consume them or destroy them. As a matter of fact, I'll be their savior. I'll lead them out of bondage. I will lead them into that promised land, as you heard, into that land flowing with milk and honey. I will not consume or destroy because they are my people. I want to touch now for just a minute on the concept of the holy ground. In this passage, you might have heard the Lord told Moses, take your sandals off for the ground you are standing on is holy ground. Friends, in one of the worst things that ever happened at a fuge camp, I was not even on staff. Jonathan, Julie, this is when I was an adult going with a youth group to a fuge camp listening to somebody else preach. And I don't remember much about that week, but I remember the guy preached this passage, preached the burning bush, preached holy ground. And there were probably five, 600 people there in Panama City Beach, Florida, and it was really hot. And that night he said, I want everybody in here to take their shoes off. And I was thinking, not a good idea. I know these guys. I'm rooming with them. I've been playing ball with them. I've seen their showering habits. I've experienced the smell of the room where we're staying. I've encountered some of their shoes and socks. Not a good idea. But, hey, I got to give the guy props. It's been a lot of years since that happened, and I do distinctly remember him preaching and teaching on the concept of holy ground and asking us all 600 of us to take our shoes off that night and worship, which we did. Listen to this, friends. It's not that the ground itself was holy. There was nothing special about that ground. There's nothing special about this ground I'm standing on right now, but it was the presence of God that made it holy. Any place where we encounter God is a special and holy place. If you are in your home and you are encountering God there, if you are in your room, if you have a place you've set apart for your quiet time, if you like to sit outside or inside or a special chair, that's a, that's a holy place where you encounter God. A holy place for me is about 15 minutes up the road from here. I'd love for you to see it one day. It's called Look Up Lodge. It's just a camp. It's got cabins and a lake. I went there as a senior in high school. Not really sure about a lot of things about the Lord, but my friend said, hey, come on this trip with my church. I went to Look Up Lodge, and I encountered the Lord there, and that's holy ground to me. And when I go back there, I remember it. I was thinking about Carson Newman, and friends, there's nothing real special about Carson Newman, although I love it a lot. But for many of you, that's holy ground. It's holy ground because in a, in a Bible study class or a dorm room or that worship auditorium or maybe a bench around campus, you encounter the Lord and it's a holy and special place for you. And that's what God was saying to Moses that day. Any place that you encounter me is holy, is set apart. Friends, I want to give you knowledge and teaching about the character of God that can get into your bones tonight and burn there and smolder there and become part of who you are. And so I want to finish tonight with one of my favorite things to talk about, which is the concept of the I am. And some of you may have heard me speak or teach on this before. The concept of the I am, and I ask people this question a lot, and to be honest, a lot of people don't know the answer. Where's the first place in scripture where we see God referred to as the great I am, calling himself I am? It's Exodus chapter three, the burning bush. 
here's kind of what happened. We read it, but let's go a little bit deeper. The Egyptians had over 200 gods, lowercase g. They had over 200 gods that they worshipped, and every one of them had a name. That seems kind of silly to me. But Moses says to God, hey, the people are going to ask me, who is this God that you're speaking of that's given you this message, that's told you you're going to lead the people? Who is this God? And I'm going to need a name. Gods, lowercase g, around Egypt have names. And God, friends, in one of my favorite God moments, God says, yeah, that's, that's cool. I've got a name. You can tell them my name. I am. Look at it in your Bible if you have God's Word. I hope your Bible has it all caps. I am. The great I am. Let's talk about the I am for a minute. I am signifying what? God's eternal power. Write it down. Unchanging character. I love to teach people this. God is self-existent. He doesn't need anything. He doesn't need anyone. Be careful any time that you start a statement with God needs. God needs the students of Poplarville. Mm, stop. God has no needs. God can use. God wants to use. God designed the youth of Poplarville to be used in this way. But God needs. Mm. God is self-existent. He is the I am. He has no beginning or end. If you go to God and say, I don't really understand how you've always existed, he'll say, I am. God, I don't really understand how, how you always make decisions. You don't seek advice from anyone. You don't need any wisdom or knowledge. I am. God, how did you create this world out of nothing? How did you speak this world into existence? I am. I love the I am. Side note, some of you have heard me say this before. When school starts back, and I pray it will start in a somewhat normal way for you guys. When school starts back, I want you to go to your English teacher, 8th grade, ninth grade, 10th grade, especially at the high school. You're safe because if you get in trouble, Coach Ray will take care of it. I want you to go to your English teacher and say, I know the shortest complete sentence in the English language. Complete sentence. Got to have a subject and a verb. The boy ran. You got a complete sentence. You got a subject boy and a verb ran. You can make that sentence longer. You can add to it. The boy ran down the street. The boy ran quickly down the street. The boy ran quickly down the street with his ball. But if you have the boy and the ran, you got a complete sentence. You walk up to your English teacher and say, I know the shortest complete sentence in the English language. And then you look him or her in the eye and you say, I am. And then you turn and you walk away. And they either put an A down in the grade book for your incredible intelligence and understanding of the English language, or they go and find Coach Ray and talk to him about disrespect. He'll take care of it. I am is incredibly powerful. I wanted to remind you, and I could preach on this for a long time, and have, and some of you may have heard, but I want to remind you when we get to Jesus in the book of John, the Gospel of John, Jesus will begin seven, the perfect number, statements about himself with the words, I am. And that's Jesus revealing, saying, proclaiming that he's God. Because I am is God. And when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, he's saying, God, light of the world. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the gate for the sheep. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the vine, you are the branches. Every time he starts with I am. He's proclaiming his godness. And this all traces back to Exodus chapter 3 when God says, you need a name for me? I got one. It goes to eternity past and eternity future. It's I am. It's Yahweh, friends. When you hear Yahweh in the Old Testament, it's I am. If you're interested in that, if you want to learn more about that, I'm really more and more getting into book recommendations. If one person will read a book that I recommend, it's all worth it. Maybe it's Julie Ray. A great book. It's called I Am Changes Who I Am. Great title. I Am Changes Who I Am. When you understand the great I am, it changes who you are.
who you am. Great book. A lot of the things that I love to teach about the I am statements of Christ are found right here. And we need to know those. We need to understand, and we've talked at camp, if you were there, about the light of the world. We need to understand the character of God, the character of Jesus, the Son of God, God in human flesh. We need to understand those so they can get in our bones and burn in there. God's Word is a, is a fire in my bones. Let me finish tonight with this thought. It's truth. The only way for us to come into the presence of God is to be holy ourselves. We've talked about His holiness, His distinction, that great separation between Him and the created man. The only way for us to come into God's presence is to be holy ourselves. And so right now, if you're like me, you're thinking, well, I'll never be able to be in the presence of God because I'm not holy. I'm not righteous, I'm not perfect, I'm not set apart, I'm trying, but I'm struggling. So how will I ever come into the presence of God based on my own holiness? And the answer to that is real simple, friends. You won't. None of us ever will. But hear this, hear the beautiful message of the gospel tonight. I can approach the Holy One without fear. Moses had fear. Moses hid his face. Moses knew he could not be in the presence of the Holy One. Wow, because Moses is real far from holy. Moses had murdered a guy. Did you know that? I don't have to hide my face. I can come boldly into the presence of God because I have faith and trust in the person of Jesus Christ and in his work on the cross and in his holiness. Like I come to God in the holiness of Christ. I come to God dressed, as I've told you, in the righteousness of Christ. And so I can come into his presence. The New Testament tells me I can come boldly into his presence. Not in my own holiness, but because I have the holiness of Christ. And so I want you to think about that I want you to ponder, that means consider, continue to think about the things we've talked about tonight. I want those things to get deep into you, into your bones, right? His word, the truths that we've talked about tonight, they burn in my heart like a fire, like a fire in my bones. It's in flavor. So again, I'm looking forward to several more nights with you. I've got some ideas, some things I think you'll find interesting, hopefully learn something, encounter the Lord in a new, fresh way. Let me pray for you, and we'll wrap up for tonight. God, tonight, uh, we love to study your word. I pray that we treated it carefully, studied it accurately. We see tonight, God, in the burning bush, your holiness, your glory, your concern for your people, God. Tonight, we, we see those words, I am, as you identify your power and your unchanging nature and your self-existence and your eternity past to eternity future, God. Tonight, we want these truths about you that we believe with every part of who we are. We want them to be deeper and deeper in us, and we want them to burn. We want them to smolder. We want them to continue to be a fire that leads us and guides us and lights us. God, we want to learn more about you this week. We want to talk more about being on fire for you, being consumed by you in a way that does not end, God, like that bush was not destroyed. But we want to be filled and consumed with your spirit and, and with knowledge of you and our hearts and our bones, God. I pray for students, adults that joined us tonight, that you've spoken to them by name, like you spoke to Moses by name, that you've encouraged them, that you've taught them, that they feel closer now to you than they did before we began tonight's study pray for them in Jesus' strong and powerful name. Amen. What's up, guys? It's Cam. Hola, me llamo Gabriel. Hi, it's Grace. Wasn't that such an awesome worship and message brought by Will Snipes and MC Atlas? So now we're about to jump into our Zoom groups, and you should have already received your meeting ID and password from your Bible study leader. So if not... If you haven't gotten that information or you've lost it somehow, then stay tuned because on the screen you'll have all the information you'll need to log into your Zoom group. We just encourage you to utilize this time to talk to 
others around you any questions, express any thoughts you had about worship or with a message. We just encourage you to be open and really let the spirit move. So without further ado, three, two, one.